Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on uh, where you're logging in from. This is Jason Crawford with Partner First. I want to welcome you guys to this special webinar in regard to half as big changes. And I, a lot of our webinars, I open them up and I say I want to welcome you to this special webinar because a lot of these stuff are just really good topics. But this one is certainly unique and unto itself, one, because it's, it's such a huge game changer in our overall industry as a whole. But also here at Partner First, it's a little different for us in that this is a training that's opened up beyond just the borders of our membership base. And this allows a, uh, a rare and, and public look into the Partner First training. There's a lot going on in the short sale space, and we are at ground zero. So as always, we want to continue on with the uh, groundbreaking education that we provide for our members on the network as well as to open it up to other agents in the uh, surrounding areas just to gain exposure to this, this huge half a change that's going on. On the line with us, we have Jacob Swodek, our Director of Education. He's actually going to be uh, talk, talking about the big half a changes, breaking them down, talking about the keys and, and why this is important. And then I'll come back a little bit later and talk about some exciting news we have here at Partner First. But first, before we get started, as always, I like to do a quick audio sound check just to make sure that everybody has uh, good audio. So if you could please, in the question box, just type in loud and clear, sounds good, I can hear you. And then also we want to check uh, Jacob's audio as well. Good morning, Jacob. How are you? Fantastic, Jason. Uh, thanks. And uh, yeah, let's see how my audio is. Jason and I are doing this presentation from different locations. So let us know how I sound and how Jason sounds as well. That'd be great. All right. Sounds good. Looks like a lot of responses are coming in. They all say both uh, OK, loud and clear. Sounds good. So uh, with that said, Jacob, I know you have a lot of ground to cover in a relatively short period of time. So I'm going to go ahead and hand the helm over to you, keeping in mind that I'm controlling on the slides on this side. So there will be a little bit of lag, but um, we'll stay in sync. So with that said, it's all yours, Jacob. Thanks, Jason, and good day to all of you. Uh, as Jason iterated, this is a, a rare and special type of a presentation that we've opened up to all of our industry partners. Uh, there was some monumental uh, news and changes that took place in our industry, especially in the default space, uh, meaning the short sale and deed and lieu side of things, uh, that happened while many of us were, uh, as I say, sipping eggnog or returning ugly sweaters that relatives gave us at Sears. Uh, during the during the Christmas break. So we thought it was worthwhile to pump the brakes with our normal uh, business and, and really be the on the forefront of getting education and breaking news to uh, the real estate industry. So we've done a, a, a good job at breaking down some of the big changes that took place with HAFA uh, recently on December 28th. Before we go into the changes, I want to sort of give an overview to HAFA. I was doing a presentation yesterday uh, to a, a, a decent sized group of agents and I was talking about HAFA and HAFA changes and about five minutes into it somebody said, what is HAFA? <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to slow down a little bit because this is sort of our baby and we've really been watching the home affordable foreclosure alternative um, as it's evolved and become more, uh, more prevalent, more of a game changer. Uh, in our industry, so I don't want to assume that everybody has been that in tune and uh, discerning to the program. So uh, if you go to the next slide, Jason, we're going to start by sort of defining uh, HAFA and, and how it began. So so an overview to HAFA. So it's a pretty new program. It launched the Treasury version on, on April of last year, 2010. Now what you'll notice, this is not a HAFA training per se, but I can uh, clue you into the fact that there are what we call three faces of HAFA. There's the Treasury's version, which is kind of a generic version uh, that is open to uh, some customization on the part of the investors with, uh, in their relationship between the investor and the servicer, uh, the mortgage servicer. And then Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, also known as GSEs or Government Sponsored Enterprises, they have come out with their own versions of HAFA, which they had every right to an intention to do so because the Treasury version was written in a generic way in order to be customized by the loan investor, and in this case, Fannie and Freddie Mac uh, being the largest loan investor group. So the Treasury's version, the more generic version, launched April of last year, and then Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's versions, which were notable, 
uh, launched in August, uh, a few months afterwards, because they needed some time to customize and really drill down on what this program what was going to be like. Because there, there's a lot of skin in the game. There's a lot of people's reputations on the line for this program to work. So in, in essence, HAFA stands for Home Affordable Foreclosure Alternative. Home Affordable Foreclosure Alternative. It is under the umbrella of the parent organization or parent program called HAMP, Home Affordable Modification Program. So the modification program is the parent organization or the parent program called HAMP. Many of us have heard about HAMP. And then uh, as, a, uh, as a appendage to that program, there is the half a program for short sales and or deeds in lieu, people that just don't meet the criteria for a loan modification or do not uh, desire to uh, modify their home. They would rather uh, do a graceful exit and move on from the property. So there's all kinds of rules and bells and whistles. And I should tell you that HAFA is not a law. It's not, uh, uh, they are not necessarily uh, rigid rules, but they really are guidelines, very strong suggestions given by uh, our government, by the U.S. Treasury, for servicers and investors to follow. What you should know is that HAFA is voluntary. Um, uh, many of the servicers, actually all the servicers who are participating with the HAMP program automatically must participate with HAFA. But the caveat is that their investor clients, because the servicer works on the behalf of the investor nine times out of ten of the $13 trillion in mortgage debt, nine times out of ten they work on the behalf of the, ser the servicer works on the behalf of the investor. So just because the servicer, B of A, City, Chase, Wells, Aurora, Carrington, just because they are participating doesn't necessarily mean that their investor clients are. And that's been sort of the uh, quandary, if you will, thus far. So that's what that program is. It was designed to bring uniformity to the short sale space, streamline more process and, and, uh, and, and more regular procedure, which we all know the, pro the, the process short sale needed all those things. But the idea is, uh, did it really work? Well, some interesting things happened. In early December 2010, John Pryor, who's the lead default writer for HousingWire.com, which is a great resource, by the way, HousingWire.com, came out with some sort of breaking um, uh, expose type news. And he did the math that $4.3 million had been spent of this TARP uh, reserve money that was set aside for the half a program, whether it be to incentivize borrowers with their relocation assistance or the servicer incentive, and $4.3 million had been spent. And they did the math, got his calculator out, and figured that that was an estimated 661 half of sales that had uh, closed from April 5th, its inception, through the uh, first day of December. And that was a very, uh, that was a very sad number, especially when you uh, understand that the ambition of the half a program was to help uh, 3 million homeowners. So in its first year, it helped under 1,000. Now I'll tell you, if you're a uh, history junkie, you remember in 2009 when HAMP, the Home Affordable Modification Program, launched, their first reporting of numbers after two and a half quarters was only 784 uh, permanent modifications that had been offered with a program that was supposed to help millions of homeowners as well. And uh, we're not huge fans of the HAMP program. But I can tell you that they have revised it several times, and it is getting better and better as it evolves. And now it's helped closer to a million uh, homeowners. So, uh, you know, so I, and that's all debatable. There's a, a, a high redefault rate, and and there's been challenges to the program that have helped it uh, not be the success that it was supposed to be. But I think what we can take away from that is the fact that half a two will evolve, and uh, and that's what this whole webinar is about: is that half a has evolved. And HAFA has actually evolved in a major way. So you see here challenges to prior version. The prior version of HAFA, which we just defined up there, um, had some major challenges. These are going to be big, broad stroke assessments. But just believe us when we tell you that even at Partner First, where we were really cheering on the Treasury and Fannie and Freddie for coming out for the, with these programs and hoping that they were really going to help streamline the system, once we read them, uh, with a cup of tea and really sat back with our legs crossed and, and really identified the reality of the program, we became instant critics of the program. Some of uh, the other designations or training platforms uh, began to sing half of praises almost immediately, calling it a game changer. 
Uh, but the reality is there were some gaping holes in the process that we felt in advance was going to uh, cause it to not be successful in its initial run. And it's not because we're brilliant or rocket scientists. Just it is what it is. We understand the nature of servicers. Uh, they're our clients, and we love them. But uh, the truth is they're not prepared for this type of volume. They're not prepared for the default onslaught that they've received. They are in business to collect payments, process payments, and work as a liaison between the borrower and the investor. And when you have a mortgage meltdown like we have, you're going to have people uh, that are that, that slip through the cracks, files that become backlogs, and these servicers that kind of throw their hands up and are unsure what to do. Later on, Jason's going to talk to you a little bit about what Partner First offers, and it plays right into HAFA, and it plays right into the fact that these servicers are having to outsource to component or subservicing outfits to really help with the, with the scrubbing of HAFA, the underwriting, and then also the lead distribution model. So some of the challenges to the prior version, uh, number one, it favored the mortgage servicer. And I'll drill down deeper on that when we look at the seven major changes. Number two, it was way too complicated and exclusive. Uh, you really had to uh, jump through hoops to be qualified for the HAFA program, which again, we will address when we look um, at these seven major changes. Thirdly, it had very little accountability measures for the mortgage servicers. Now, this is not beat up the mortgage servicers, but we, we just have a very honest approach about the fact that it was too much to handle. And the initial HAFA program, which, by the way, many of the representatives from the major mortgage servicing outfits um, were a big part of designing the program, and it shows. And the accountability measures were low. It was too uh, hard to qualify for. It was almost like you got the sense that they were pressured into participating, but they didn't do it wholeheartedly. And there's a bunch of reasons for that, but needless to say, that, that is the case. And then fourthly, the subordinate liens, also known as junior liens or seconds and thirds, were largely disinterested in the program. That is an understatement, to say the least. They were. Um, I actually have uh, been in large uh, or high-level meetings where servicers that service for mainly uh, distressed seconds said right out uh, publicly that we are not uh, our clients are not participating in the half a program because the incentives weren't there for seconds to participate. Um, I, I wrote a blog called Half a Short Sale, H-A-L-F, <laughs> Half a Short Sale, because my feeling was it does not address the second half of a short sale uh, transaction, which is the junior lien. It's not juicy enough for the junior lien to uh, to want to participate. And it, because it's voluntary, uh, the program is, then we saw that as a major obstacle. So. What happened is, uh, and I can tell you, we, we do business. I, I'm a realtor in the state of California. And we have a new president. Her name is Beth Pierce. And it's very, uh, it's been um, you know, really uh, documented recently that Beth Pierce and the California Association of Realtors wrote a very stern letter to Tim, Timothy Geithner. That's his picture up there. That's probably the look he had after he read her letter. <laughs> and, uh, and all the uh, other officers in uh, for the California Association of Realtors, just really railroading uh, the Treasury for this uh, haphazard program, um, naming very specifically all the challenges and the critiques of the program, just how it's really failed and floundered, and demanding change from the real estate community. Um, and again, it's documented that that is what sort of thwarted um, these uh, meetings to start taking place till midnight, uh, apparently at the at the at the uh, in Capitol Hill in Washington to bring change to the HAFA program. And it happened at a, at a very strange time where things were pretty slow in Washington, and it was time to revisit this because they knew that this year, once the program hit its one-year anniversary, that there was going to be major scrutiny if this program did not have some level of success. And with 661 sales under their belt, needless to say, it was far from uh, reaching the mark that they were striving towards. So. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about what these changes are, but I wanted to really give you a snapshot of what the program uh, was like prior to these changes. So Jason, let's go to the next slide, if you could. So then, uh, three days after Christmas, it appeared. The desperately needed half of policy changes, and they are good changes. If you're a note taker, you see that form right there, and it says at the top, uh, or right below the top, Supplemental Directive 
10 stands for uh, the year that it came out because it was in 2010. Then 18 is that it's the 18th uh, in a row of succession of the different directives that came out that year. So Supplemental Directive 1018, anybody who is uh, a student uh, of the industry and, and especially in the default space, I encourage you after this webinar to Google search. Just do a Google search right in your Google toolbar there and type in Supplemental Directive 10-18. The very first um, result in your Google search will be a HP admin PDF uh, that is hosted online. You can print that as public information. I will tell you that the, the that the directive is a little bit tough to read. It was designed to be read by servicers, not by homeowners, and also not by uh, realtors. It was designed for servicers from the Treasury. I should probably also make another disclaimer, and it says it right there on the first page. These changes do not affect Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac half a, uh, the Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac half a program. Now that's nothing to kind of boo or hiss about, because the reality is that's the trend. Treasury launched their program in April. Fannie and Freddie came out with theirs in August. They will revise to some degree, is our understanding, but understand that that Treasury really sets the bar and then it's up to the loan investor groups to customize these changes. So it is monumental, but it will be even more monumental um, if and when the GSEs, Fannie or Freddie, decide to adopt these changes to some degree. So I will tell you today, if you're doing a half a short sale, make sure you check whether or not it is a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac owned or guaranteed uh, loan. If it is, then these changes do not apply as of today. If it's not, then you can uh, then you can uh, feel more confident that these changes will apply. So that's a little disclaimer about the more fine print here within this program. But again, it's nothing to be uh, saddened by. It's just the way that this process works. Treasury leads the way, and then the investors follow suit. So we don't have a timeline on when Fannie or Freddie will revise their program for the better. But uh, if it's anything like last time, it's going to happen in the next four to five months. So let's talk about these changes. Uh, let's exactly thank you, Jason. The first change, um, and you know, these changes will uh, will make more sense if you have studied the HAFA program. But if you haven't, just to keep it simple for you, I'll at least define why these changes are important in comparison to the original version of HAFA. So let's talk about the first one. HAFA changes as per the Supplemental Directive 1018. Number one change that we'll talk about is in the monthly gross income arena. Servicers are no longer required to verify a borrower's financial information or to determine if the borrower's total monthly mortgage payment exceeds 31% of their monthly gross income. The new changes only require them to verify hardship to uh, by obtaining a signed hardship affidavit or RMA. So let me pump the brakes there. So in the past, in order to qualify for half of one of the eligibility requirements were that you had to prove through verifiable income that your mortgage payment was at least 31% of your adjusted gross income. Now, uh, if you don't have a lending background, you know that that can be a tedious process and slow down the forward progress of the uh, half a program. Um, and different servicer investor groups were having different set of requirements to prove that uh, 31%. And so what, what they did in, uh, on December 28th was completely did away with all the fancy math equations. They, they made it much more simple that, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, all you have to do to qualify for HAFA on the front end in terms of income eligibility is to fill out the RMA, which stands for Request for Modification Affidavit, which has the hardship affidavit attached to it and send that in for uh, eligibility. Uh, uh, send that in to, to be able to be uh, you know, given the information from the service of whether or not you're eligible. That's a big plus. And, and what you're going to notice is the sort of spirit of these changes is that Timothy Geithner and his, uh, 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 his group that he works with there at the Treasury on these types of foreclosure relief programs what they're doing is they're opening the parameters. They're making it less servicer-centric and more homeowner-centric, more uh, uh, opening more wide this door to, to be a more successful program. And, and I think that's going to be the trend of this program's ev you know, evolution as we move forward. 
So the 31% is no longer necessary. What's the key? This change only removes the requirement to verify financial information. The RMA, however, does require that the borrower state income, assets, and expenses. Also, each servicer may require in its HAFA policy that the borrowers who failed at HAMP provide, HAMP is the modification program, that those individuals provide updated financial information to evaluate the borrower. Again, really drilling down on, on the spirit of these changes, making it easier to qualify. Monthly gross income, just fill out the RMA, and that's all that I, the servicer, need to analyze in order to deem you eligible for the HAFA program. Fantastic. Number two, vacant property. A borrower can still qualify for HAFA if they do not occupy the property as long as they can prove they lived there not more than 12 months ago. In the past, a borrower had to have moved more than 100 miles away less than 90 days ago and, um, and, and that the move had to be as a result of a work transfer. So again, servicer-centric language. Servicers saying, well, if we're going to participate in half or allow a borrower to, we want them to get through the eye of a needle. We've got to calculate their adjusted gross income, and we've got to make sure if they have vacated the property, that these aren't people that are just jumping around, uh, that, that it's because of work. It was at least 100 miles away, and it was within 90 days ago. Well, that's just crazy. That's not the real world. Matter of fact, as an active agent, I've had clients that move out the second they miss their first payment because they think it's unethical. So that person moves out. Now, they don't qualify for the program, even though in their mind, whether it be their religious belief or their own personal convictions, feels like, I don't want to live here if I'm not making the payment. Now you're disqualified from HAFA. So this was a big change, again, opening the parameters of HAFA to help people that have vacated their property. One thing that the slide doesn't say is you can move as far away as you want within 12-month period. doesn't matter what the reason is, but one caveat is that you cannot have purchased another property in the meantime. You can't buy something else and then still put your other vacant house through HAFA. You could not have purchased another property. The key, this change opens the HAFA eligibility wide open. In my experience, many delinquent borrowers vacate the property out of fear of the unknown, embarrassment, foreclosure, etc. So that's a big plus, vacant property. Let's move on to the next one. So here we go. Let's talk a little bit about the release of subordinate liens. It might be a term some of us are not familiar with. Subordinate just means junior, uh, or in, in, in lay terms, seconds and thirds. And in some places in the country, maybe fourths and fifths, but uh, those are going to have a hard time going through half of so this is exciting because I talked to you in our intro about the fact that the uh, priority was not there for these junior subordinate liens to participate in the program. Well, this is not going to change it overnight, but I can tell you it is definitely, definitely a positive step in the right direction. Let's look at it. Release of subordinate liens. Junior liens will still be paid in the order of priority, meaning seconds before thirds. However, servicers are no longer limited by that 6% cap. The servicer on behalf of the loan investor must determine the amount that each subordinate lien holder will receive of the 6000 aggregate cap. All of the $6,000 must be utilized. So let's pump the brakes. What that means is in the past there was this virtual $6,000 sitting in the queue or in the kitty, if you will. But that $6,000 could only be utilized up to the extent of how big that lien was, for example. If there was only a first and a second, we're only talking about junior liens here, and that second was a $30,000 second, that second could only receive 6% of the unpaid principal balance of that $30,000, which would equal $1,800, which would mean that $4,200 that could have been used to incentivize that junior wasn't able to be used because the lien amount wasn't large enough. Now, those of you who are savvy in the short sale space know that the industry standard today is a minimum of $3,000 that the senior lien holder, the first, traditionally allows the second to get. So on top of me being the investor on a junior lien, being told I'm only going to get $1,800 on a smaller lien, I'm also being told that I have to completely satisfy that lien. I, can, I, I have to waive my rights to deficiency. I can never collect from the borrower. And I can't ask anybody for any cash contributions. I can't get a promissory note and you're going to give me less than the industry standard, less than I would get as a proprietary short sale, I'm out. Why would I participate? And they have a very valid point. 
That's the old program. The new program is there's $6,000 in the kitty. And regardless of how big or small that second is, they get 6000 every time. 6000 every time. Now, those of you who are working in areas where the dollar amounts are such that seconds are anywhere from 50 to 100,000, it's a positive change. But if you're in an area where seconds are really small, like 15 to 30, 40,000, it's a huge change. You're able to give a big chunk of change to that second to make them go away. They still must abide by all the anti-deficiency guidelines that HAFA has put into place. They still cannot get cash contributions from anybody a party to the transaction nor can they have the borrower sign a promissory note. But there's going to be more skin in the game, more of this TARP funding to help that second be incentivized to agree to the short sale. So no longer will there be a 6% cap. Get the 6% cap out of your mind. Get the 31% of your adjusted gross income out of your mind. Those percentages are gone. Calculators are no longer needed for HAFA. It's just about six grand goes to the junior. It's going to get complicated when there's a third and then it's up to that investor and servicer on the first who gets what. I can see there's going to be some, some fighting going on there. But let's assume that most of the transactions have first and second. This is a big plus as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, so that's, that's, that's the third big change. Let's move on to the fourth. OK, the timeline for issuance of the SSA. I have to slow down a little bit on this one because this will make more sense to people that are more astute to the HAFA program. If you're not familiar with the HAFA program, you will not um, maybe completely understand how big this is. HAFA, in my estimation, has two major swim lanes, if you will. Let's call one swim lane, kind of let me help you paint the picture here. Let's call the SSA swim lane. SSA stands for short sale agreement. Another large network said that it stands for short sale approval. It doesn't. It stands for short sale agreement. So swim lane A is the SSA swim lane or, or path of procedure. And then there's another swim lane that we call the ALT-RAS, or some services are calling A-RAS. So let's talk about the SSA swim lane. Under the old HAFA guidelines on non-Fannie Freddie uh, transactions for HAFA, this is the way it would play out. And I'm going to take something that's kind of complicated that requires way more teaching and understanding, uh, but I'm going to try to kind of really simplify just for sake of highlighting the importance of this new change. The way it would work is if a borrower failed at HAMP or didn't want HAMP, wasn't qualified for HAMP, or just reached out to a servicer for a short sale, uh, that, they, that whether it's proactive on the borrower's part or on the servicer's part because the person applied for HAMP and either failed or didn't qualify, to some, some degree, there was an eligibility process. Once one of those four things happen, the servicer has 30 days to determine if they are going to um, invite this borrower into the HAFA program. A little caveat here is the SSA program, or swim lane, is only, is only relevant if the borrower has not listed their house to sell with a, with a realtor, um, has not put a sign out front, does not have an offer on the house, does not have it in the MLS. This is just Joe Blow homeowner failed at a loan mod or read an article about half a calls the bank up. It's when there's no real estate agent involved. This is all the, the, the proactive earlier position from the homeowner or the servicer, uh, the homeowner servicer's part. Let me keep it simple. So homeowner reaches out or bank reaches out to a homeowner that does not have their house listed. And within 30 days of, of seeing if this person's eligible, they have 30 days to either deem them Ill eligible or ineligible. If they're eligible, they will send them what's called a solicitation letter. That solicitation letter is, has very clear instructions. It gives the highlighted benefits of the half a program. It is not an approval. It's just an invitation into the program to see if the person wants to participate. Yes, the servicer has done some basic eligibility um, scrubbing or research, but not enough to really, really uh, agree to a short sale yet because they don't know about junior liens, values, or what's really going on with that borrower's hardship. So they send the borrower a, a, a letter. The borrower has 14 days to respond. Let's assume the borrower says, yeah, I like the sounds of this program. I want to participate in half of the borrower calls up the number on the letter and says, this is Joe Blow from uh, you know, uh, Miami, Florida. I want to participate in half of fine. I just need to get some information from you. And they put them in the system, and they're locked in. 
then what happened is that that servicer, now it's the, the demand is on the servicer to come up with and produce what's called an SSA, the short sale agreement letter. It's a five-page letter, and it is the, uh, the golden certificate in the Willy Wonka candy bar. What do I mean by that? It is a special letter. This letter comes over to the, to the homeowner, and it will tell them what their minimum acceptable net proceeds will be or what sales price they need to market the house at. They will also tell them uh, that they'll accept 6% commission. It will also say, go hire a local broker. So when this program picks up steam, many of you on this phone call today will receive phone calls from uh, homeowners that receive these SSA saying, hey, are you familiar with HAFA? Uh, because I got this letter saying to call a broker to come sell my house. So be ready for that, although we're not seeing too much of that today. Here is the major gaping hole in the original HAFA program. If you remember how HAFA was advertised, it was to bring uniformity and a streamlined process, speed this thing up, right? But the funny thing is that all of the demand is on the consumer, the homeowner, and the realtor. But then the servicers have all the time in the world to do the most critical steps in the process. For example, under the initial HAFA rollout, the servicer had an undisclosed amount of time, as long as they want. Once the homeowner opts in and says, yes, within the 14-day time period, I want HAFA, then the servicer has as much time as they want to decide if they're going to offer an SSA to that homeowner. And guess what? The clock is still ticking on foreclosure. Major problem, major oversight has to be fixed. Where is the accountability for the servicers, as we talked about earlier? there's not enough accountability for the mortgage servicing community. Well, that has changed. As of yesterday, February 1st, these servicers now, from the day that the homeowner opts in with the phone call or in writing, within that 14-day time period to say, yes, count me and I want to uh, try to participate in HAFA, that servicer now has 30 days. 30 days to accept that homeowner or reject that homeowner for half, either send them an SSA or a letter clearly defining why they are not eligible for half. -a. Now, in the real world, that is uh, maybe not that exciting because we're not seeing a lot of SSAs being issued. But I can tell you, this is huge because what it's doing is it's doing what HAFA was supposed to do from the beginning. It's setting parameters and guidelines and accountability measures for not just the agent and the homeowner, but also for the servicer. If a homeowner reaches out, mark your calendar. And 30 days later, they better issue you an SSA in writing, or they should issue you a rejection letter. I wish that the HAMP loan mods were that easy. How many of us know people in our market area who have been trying for a HAMP loan mod for months and months and months, and the banks get away with murder by just saying, well, uh, we, we're waiting for documentation. We didn't receive your last package. It's all because there's no accountability. Now under HAFA, all you have to do is call in, and it gets recorded. Yes, you call in on this day, and 30 days later they have to offer the consumer a, an SSA. And then the way the story goes is once they get the SSA, they have 120 days, the homeowner does, to contact the realtor, get it listed at the price given on the SSA. Once an offer comes in, they have three uh, calendar day, or sorry, three business days to get in the fully executed offer, uh, proof of funds, uh, study on the junior liens, and the RAS, which is the RASS, requesting approval of a short sale. And then from that point, once they get that in, now the bank has, servicer has 10 days to accept uh, the short sale to give a full-blown approval to move forward to close escrow. So this is a huge plus that we'll see played out later on this year. Let's move to the next one. So this is kind of a, a, a similar change. Uh, number five, the timeline for the response to the alternative RAS. So we talked about two swim lanes. One, the SSA swim lane, no agent involved, homeowner just reaching out to the bank or a bank reaching out to the homeowner based on a failed loan mod or lack of eligibility. Uh, so that's that. Well, let's look at another swim lane now, the alt RAS swim lane, which is a little bit ambiguous as well. We were on the phone with uh, Moscadillas yesterday, um, who is doing some servicing for Bank of America on the half a side, and they have a different program than Chase, and the Chase has a different program than Litton. So we're not going to be able to really drill down with exactly what this looks like, but in essence, if you are a listing agent and your homeowner wants to participate in half of but you already have it on the market, you already have a list price, and you already have an offer, you're not going to ask them to reach out to the bank 
to get them to send them a solicitation letter just to spend 30 days to offer an SSA to give you a sales price. We're already way beyond that. Now you just want to submit the offer to be accepted so that the offer can be approved and the person and property can be approved for HAFA. That's why it's called the alternative RAS, the alternative request of approval for a short sale. It's when there's already an offer and the borrower wants to apply for HAFA uh, because of all the benefits. In, in some cases, when a homeowner and an agent want to put the deal through as HAFA, they can just go onto that servicer's website, download their uh, alternative RAS form, which has been customized. Aurora and Chase do it that way. You just fill out the part that you're supposed to as a realtor slash homeowner, send it to the bank with the offer, and uh, await an answer. Sometimes certain servicers like Bank of America and certain portfolios with portfolios that they're doing with Moss Cadillus out of uh, Colorado is that they do not they don't put their alt RAS on online for consumption of consumers. What they will do is that you have to actually call in, request HAFA, and then once you get the solicitation letter, um, when you prove there's an offer, then they will release the alt RAS to you, which I think probably makes more sense, even though it just slows the process down a little bit. Needless to say, whatever way you come about obtaining the alternative RAS form to submit to the bank for an answer, and this is more real world stuff. This is the, the, the biggest change, I think, in the whole uh, new set of revisions that's going to help you and me that's on this phone today is that as of now, or as of the old, uh, tr uh, the old Treasury version, when, when you got to the point of sending the alternative RAS to uh, the servicer, they had an, uh, an undisclosed amount of time. They could take as long as they want to offer uh, an approval of HAFA to that homeowner. There was no accountability. It could take uh, six days, six months, six years. There, it, it just didn't exist. But yet this program was supposed to streamline and make it uniform and really push the envelope to, to get this thing to work faster. But yet the two biggest areas where the big demand is on the servicer to approve, reject, or counter these short sales, whether it be the SSA route or the Alt-RAS route, there was no accountability. Well, guess what? As of yesterday, now the servicers have 30 days from when you submit the Alt-RAS and they confirm receipt, 30 days to accept, reject, or counter your offer as a half a short sale. That is huge. It's monumental, but it's also scary because one of the concerns I'm getting and feedback from our blog and our other ways that we communicate with uh, our partners in this industry is that there's no way, no how, the servicers will be able to get organized fast enough to implement this model. And the question is, what's the accountability? What if they don't get me the alt rafts approved, rejected, or countered within 30 days? Who do I tell? What do I do? And you know, I think you could probably take it up the food chain with uh, the executive management at some of these larger servicing um, outfits. But also I think it's Congress people and it's also the president of your state association. Let's be on these servicers to make sure they're complying with these guidelines. And, and I'm, not a, I'm not a negative Nancy, if you will. I, I believe they'll do their best, but I just don't think they're going to be anywhere near ready in the initial rollout. So this is huge, huge, huge. When you send in an alt raft you can mark your Google Calendar. In 30 days, you better have an answer for me. And you can also tell that to the buyer's agent, to tell the buyer, tell your seller. Now we have a system. Now we've got something we can sink our teeth into. Now granted, the caveat is that has nothing to do with the second. So I hope you're a good negotiator because you need to be fast getting that second to respond. You're probably even going to have to educate these second loss mitigation departments. Hey, this is going as half of There's a new 30-day guideline. I need to know quickly if the investor is going to participate. They get six grand, but they've got to give us something saying that they will waive their rights to future deficiency. Fair enough. <laughs> and you've got to do that quick because you don't want to be the reason this thing drags once this servicer moves quickly on the alt wraps approval. So that's a big plus. That's something to, to get excited about. Let's go to the next slide, Jason. Real estate brokerage commissions. Sounds more exciting than it is, but I wanted to cover it just to be thorough. Um, once, uh, when HAFA first came out, the announcement was November 30th of 2009, and then it was already revised March 26th of 2010 before its inception on April 5th. And in that first mini revision, they had already addressed the 6% commission. So under Treasury, half a, we're already a guaranteed 6%, but the caveat is if you're a realtor and you want 6% on a half a short sale, you may need to make sure that the listing agreement says 
it's interesting, and I like this. It's, you could tell that there's some downward pressure from NAR, but it's based on uh, what the listing agreement is. So we need to educate homeowners that we are allowed to earn 6% as a half a short sale. And to be quite frank with you, you should be getting 6% on all your short sales, whether it's half a or a proprietary non-half a short sale. That's not where the change is at. I'm going to read this for you. The change is in the verbiage on the SSA and the alternative RAS. The following verbiage will be added to these forms. It's going to say this. And, and if you go to the, um, do that Google search for Supplemental Directive 1018, you can see an example of this verbiage. Vendor fees or charges will not be charged to you and will not be deducted from the real estate commission, you meaning the borrower. Additionally, any outsourcing firm or third party retained as an agent for us may not charge either directly or indirectly an outsourcing fee, short sale negotiating fee, or similar fee in connection with the short sale. So here's an interesting place to uh, pump the brakes, especially those of you who are premium certified members for Partner First. Jason's going to talk about something really exciting in a few moments. But I want you to know that this more is about what we're doing. We are working with the component servicing arms, meaning the outsourced servicers that these large major mortgage servicers have to hire and group up with in order to work through this disposition, this huge onslaught of defaulted properties that are going to go through this waterfall, right, from the, from the loan mod to short sale deed in lieu to foreclosure. What it's saying is that these component servicers, like that Partner First is working with, cannot charge you, the agent, for, for, for the work based on this uh, language here. It's a good thing for realtors. It's something to be positive about. Let's look at the key. This verbiage provides more transparency to the fees paid to outsourcing companies. It protects the agent's commission and is a hint of the trend that is emerging. And, and if you're discerning, your, your ears are perking up a little bit right now. Component servicing companies will be a large part of the short sale disposition effort in the light of the servicer's lack of ability to fulfill specialized services such as lead distribution, short sale file processing, etc. So if I am a seasoned uh, agent or a discerning studious agent, what I'm saying is, wow, Treasury, when they met over the Christmas break, over the holiday break, thought it was so important and they knew and had their ear to the ground that this outsourcing top-down short sale distribution model was going to be so uh, real coming up real soon. We need to make sure that we define who gets paid what, the economics of that, so we don't scare agents and scare homeowners away. That is that mortgage servicing company's uh, responsibility to make sure that they are subsidized and they are paying for those services. So what does that tell me if I'm a premium certified agent? I'm saying, hey, this is interesting. We're watching this model unfold that was just a vision several years ago. So that's all that is there is making sure we're clear as realtors about what can and can't happen to our commission. Now let's go to the last um, slide here, Jason. Borrower notices. I'm going to go through this one slowly because there's a lot of confusion about this one. I'm going to read it. And this has to do with a borrower receiving notice while they're in the process. So I'm going to make sure we uh, get this because it's important for us to know, and I'll tell you why, because we're going to need to have that modification conversation with all of our clients. One last major change. If a borrower who has not previously evaluated who was not previously evaluated by the servicer for HAMP, meaning the government's modification program, if that person requests a short sale or a deed in lieu, not a half a short sale, just a short sale in general, the servicer must notify the borrower verbally or in writing of the availability of HAMP, the modification program that the government instituted, and allow the borrower 14 calendar days from the date of the notification to contact the servicer uh, to request HAMP. The point is that this notification can be given simultaneously with the servicer's consideration of the borrower for HAPA. What does that mean? I'm sure there were cross wires when a borrower requested a short sale that had not been offered HAMP pre-February 1st. Presumably, the government would prefer a HAMP loan modification and therefore HAMP may be offered to borrowers seeking a short sale. Get this. This is important for realtors to understand since their short sale clients will more than likely be offered a HAMP loan mod if they are deemed eligible while you're already going through the short sale process. I always advise realtors to explore the loan modification option thoroughly with their clients before a short sale is offered. So what's the takeaway of this seventh change? 
make sure you're having conversations with people who are short selling their primary residence about modification because otherwise as real estate agents we don't punch in and punch out we get paid on closed transactions and I'm all for helping homeowners uh, steer them in the right direction to get a successful loan. I think it's good for the economy it's good for the local uh, housing uh, economy and it's good for you as a realtor because you are acting unbiased you're doing what's best for the client if in fact that's what's best for the client that being said, there is no advantage to not talking about this, uh, this, this issue of the modification. There is no advantage to you being negative, Nancy, sourpuss about it. Saying, ah, it doesn't work. They don't give you principal reductions. Don't even bother to do a short sale because you're going to be the one that wasted months of time if the borrower is deemed eligible, gets asked to participate, and they decide to do that instead of a short sale. So be thorough at the door. Be thorough at the dining room table exhaust all the options because it's important for you to know that this can be um, on the horizon. These seven changes are monumental. They're big. It doesn't mean it's going to change tomorrow, but I will tell you the importance of being educated on HAFA is more important today than it ever was. I personally have closed six HAFA short sales. I was skeptical when I read that only 661 had closed. That means I was responsible for closing 1% of the short sales that had closed nationwide. Uh, and, and the reality is that HAFA is real. The government has so much downward pressure, and with elections coming up next year, to keep people out of foreclosure that you're going to see much more emphasis on HAFA. You're seeing the servicers get a slap on the wrist. You're seeing the, the, a drilling deeper, a shifting, a changing of the guard, where HAFA is now becoming more consumer and more agent friendly and less servicer friendly, especially as servicers are on the hot plate right now. Uh, and, and really being scrutinized for some of their practices. I think some of their power is being usurped and given back to the people to say, hey, this program was set up to help people, not to look for ways to not help people. And so we're seeing that happen. I don't think it's the last of these changes, but it's very important to know half of today more than ever. And I'm going to hand it over to Jason because we have some exciting things to talk to you about, whether you're a part of Partner First and you're already uh, been implementing some of these practices and learning, or if you're just on as a guest today, uh, we're going to talk to you about how you can educate yourself more and also get involved with what's happening with uh, in, in now eight places, and it's going to grow in terms of the, the, the file flow distribution, the exciting announcement that we recently made. So Jason, I'm going to take a deep breath, hand it back to you, and I want to encourage you on the phone to hang tight. Jason's only going to talk about this opportunity for a few quick moments, and then afterwards we have a free... Um, gift for everybody who's on the call, a free offering, and we're going to give you instructions on how to get it. It's going to help you stay on board with what's happening on HAFA, and it's been updated. We've got a couple of HAFA guides we're going to give you that you can print out and put next to your desk and keep in your briefcase so you can always have a quick reference. We give that to you for free today, but stick around so you get the instructions on how to get that. It's going to really help your business. Jason, I'm going to take a breather hand it to you, and I, I understand you've got some important things that you want to talk about. Absolutely. Thanks, Jacob. T take a deep breath. You did a great job. Great information. I, I hope everybody on the line found this information informative as well as useful. I did see a lot of questions coming through, and unfortunately, due to the sheer numbers of, of agents that are on the call today, we, we won't be able to address those, unfortunately. I would encourage you to utilize the Ask the Expert and the interactive form in the Partner First website to place those questions. Uh, Jacob scours those things on a regular basis and puts a lot of time, effort, and energy into creating responses and, uh, and, and scenario-based responses. So I certainly would encourage you to drop those questions into the interactive form in the Partner First area and uh, create a, a kind of an open discussion, if you will. Um, as mentioned, Jacob said go ahead and stick around. We are, there are some half of forms and some downloads and some free gifts for you guys for being on the call. That certainly will be of a benefit for, for you and your business. I do want to take a brief moment and talk a little bit about Partner First, and I realize we have a large group of our premium certified members on the call. Um, I have some, some good news for you guys in, in anticipation of setting up some future calls and what's going on. But just in general, I wanted to acknowledge what it is that Partner First does and who we are, how we fit into the pre-foreclosure space. And overall, Partner First, as Jacob mentioned, works with mortgage servicers on an exclusive and on a preferred uh, type system, agent network in which we connect real estate agent professionals with distressed homeowners. That's about as simple as I can make it. 
but the huge underlining factor to that is we are heavily, heavily, heavily education-based. Our mortgage servicers require it, they demand it, and they want to work with agents on our network that have gone through our training process. Here's a couple 2011 facts. The rules of real estate have changed in terms of engagement and working with the mortgage servicers and working through the short sale process. 2011 fact, mortgage servicers and investors prefer agents who are highly skilled and proficient in short sale, HAFA, and FDCPA. And also in regard to the pre-foreclosure mastery as well as our regular PSC and our HSC, they meet the 2011 industry standards. They put your profile up front and center with the uh, prospective servicers and homeowners that need your help. Now, what exactly does that mean? We at Partner First, as I mentioned, we are an education company that works exclusively and on a preferred basis with the mortgage servicers. We offer different levels of certification and membership in regard to our agent network. We have our pre-foreclosure specialist certification that has been our flagship product for over several years now. And now we have just introduced the PSC or pre-foreclosure specialist 2011 version, also the pre-foreclosure specialist certification mastery, and in consignment or in conjunction rather with this call, the HAFA specialist certification. This call is was the goal is to be education based, so certainly not going to be a sales pitch here. I just want to make everybody on the call that these certifications are available to you, and as a premium certified member on the network, you are eligible to be connected with distressed homeowners. And for our premium certified members that are on the call, you may remember the major announcement that was hosted in mid-December. You will be happy to know that those files are being boarded, are being scrubbed, and are currently being worked through. And there will be some major, major traction and some changes and some, um, dare I use the word flow, but some traction moving forward in regard to these files over the next couple weeks. So certainly stay tuned to that. Stay close to the fire. We are going to have an um, announcement from our CEO, Mark Comer, here coming up towards the middle of this month in regard to that process. But it certainly is an exciting time here at Partner First. Well, I want to talk real quick, and then I'll hand it back to Jacob so he can talk about the special gifts I have offered to you. I mentioned the designations, the certifications. We do offer these in bundle packages that uh, allow for some su substantial savings. And as part of our half a webinar special pricing, we are going to take an additional $100 off all the bundle packages. That's the PSC 2011, the half a specialist certification, as well as our FDCPA, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act uh, course. The, the additional discount is only valid this week. And whether you are premium certified and you're interested in taking the half a course and, and FDCPA, or you are a premium member who has still yet to earn your PSC designation, you can certainly take the PSC as well as the HAFA and the Fair Debt course in all one discounted bundle. And if you are brand new to Partner First, you can take the PSC course, the HAFA course, and the Fair Debt course all in one bundle at a great, great reduced price. And those are all available to everybody on the call. This is, again, half a webinar special pricing and is only valid this week. So you must take advantage of it so often and all the time when we run uh, a, a specials or promos, which don't happen very often, but when they do happen, inevitably we'll get a call a day or two after it expires and says, hey, can you still validate this? Can you still honor it? And unfortunately, we can't. The systems are set. We run these at specific times, and we make these offerings available to agents that join us on these special calls and it's only available this week. So how do you take advantage of this? There's a couple options. If you're premium, premium certified, go to the members area, partnerfirst.org forward slash members. You see it there on the screen. Go ahead and log in, and uh, you will see the various options available to you right when you log in, as well as the special discounted pricing. Again, the discounted pricing will be removed this week. If you are brand new to Partner First and you have not even submitted an application, you will want to visit the website there, partnerfirst.org forward slash members. Register an account. You do need to complete an application. And once the application has been completed, uh, it will go through an approval process. And if, in fact, it is approved, then you'll be able to move on to the next step and, and enroll in the courses. Real quick, 30 seconds. I'm going to hand it back to Jacob. I just want to address a few general concerns I hear all the time as I'm having conversations all day, every day with agents in regard to these certifications 
and our network. Listen, guys, I'm a licensed broker myself. I have been for over a decade. I know better than anyone that every trainer has a widget, a gimmick, a pitch, something to sell. There's all kinds of networks for us to join. The questions or the responses I get is, I've already joined a bunch of networks and there's been zero results. I already have a ton of certifications. My response to that is, a lot of the certifications out there are good. I'm sorry you joined a bunch of networks and there haven't been results, but I can tell you that we are results driven and that this is different because we do have the exclusive contracts with the mortgage servicers. Again, we do have the exclusive contracts with the mortgage servicers and you will not be throwing good money after bad and obtaining these certifications and joining the network. In fact, you will be positioning yourself and your business for opportunity and success in 2011. I just wanted to get that point out of the way, let you guys know that it is available to you at partnerfirst.org forward slash members. If you do have questions, the 877 number is on the screen. Feel free to call in. We do have our agent management specialist here standing by. They're actually going to work through lunch here on the, uh, the West Coast so that they can take calls for you guys, answer questions in regard to these certifications, and really bring you up to speed on how you can join the network. So with that said, thank you for listening to uh, my piece. And I will hand this back to Jacob so that he can uh, show you how to receive your free offering or your free gift, and then we'll go ahead and wrap it up and, and close out this webinar. Jacob? Thanks, Jason. Uh, that, that's a great opportunity, and, and, I, and I know that, that many of you will take advantage of it. I was actually one of the leads on, on the, in terms of content for the PSC as well as the, uh, the HSC and the FDCPA training. We put a lot of work into it, and I will tell you without being braggy, uh, they are by far the best, most intuitive, comprehensive trainings on the subject of short sales HAFA and the door knocking piece. Uh, we, we really pride ourselves in the education side. It's written by active proprietors that have a, uh, a high level of success, not just about stacking order and 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 uh, and forms that you need. It's about how to close the deals, how to deal with junior lien holders, getting deep into the process. So uh, we've never given a refund on our trainings, uh, not because we don't offer it, but because without a doubt people realize uh, that this is by far the best in the business. Speaking of uh, of, of of things that we we offer um, as a sort of token to you guys for your patience, I hope you took good notes and you're ready to move forward. But we want to give you. The, these two free handouts that a lot of our members have been utilizing. The one on the left here is sort of a comparison of the three programs. Some people are just putting it right on their, um, their cubicle or their desk. Others are actually utilizing it and handing them to homeowners. Uh, and then the other one, Half of Fast Facts, is a great uh, tool, again, either for yourself or you can uh, su you know, superimpose or add your logo to it. It's a great handout to homeowners. shows that you are forward thinking and you're on the cusp of what's happening in the short sale space. If you want these um, given to you via email in electronic form, um, go ahead and go into the question box right now over in the, your, your toolbox there for the GoToWebinar, the toolbar. And in the question box, just put your name and email address. And you may want to just put something like, please send me the half of guides. So we need your name and your email. Please send me the half a guides, and we'll make sure to get those out to you within 24 to 48 hours. And again, great value for you. Again, thanks so much for being on. Thanks, Jason, for presenting the opportunity. I hope you guys take advantage of it. Put yourself in the way of opportunity in 2011, the year of liquidation. Let's get in the way of opportunity. Uh, those of you who are members, if you have further questions, please don't hesitate to go into the Ask the Expert Forum. You can call me out, Jacob, you said this. I want more clarification on that. Uh, make sure to read our blogs. And those of you who are members, don't forget we do six to eight unique short sale trainings a month. Take advantage of those. Agents that are, you're, they're seeing their commissions increase, their expertise increase, and their business flourishing. Uh, in order to grow your business, you have to know your business. This is Jacob Swodek, Director of Education from Partner First, signing off. God bless you guys, and thanks for your time.